my talk will be on history of interventional pain medicine and what is our future. If I am a little bit controversial, I apologize, but I think we must have clarity in this area and more discussion we have, better it will be. So let me start off on a journey from history on a riverboat and look at our classical period, which we call early civilization. You will be surprised how smart and brilliant they were at that time. These people who 90,000 years ago or even a million years ago were like us, Homo erectus, Cro-Magnon, modern man. There isn't much difference genetically as well as in a physiognomy. And there is no doubt that they suffered terribly to survive. Pain must have been there. And they always thought about how to take care of their pain. Injuries were there due to hunting. Injuries are here and due to the wars at this time. And can we really say that pain wasn't there from the time we started our civilization? What did they do? They were smart. They didn't have much, but yet they were in the nature, the new nature. They learned from the animals. They learned from the plants. And they had the most fantastic herbal knowledge of what medicines were helpful to them. They observed the animals and found that they were healthy when they were sick by doing certain things, digging the ground or smelling this or eating this plant. And we developed certain analgesics at the time which were used commonly in that civilization. Scopolamine was one of those, hyoscyamine was one of those. And opium, believe it or not, was a very early discovery in our classical civilization. Not to me that, but they also felt there is more to be needed. And they looked at mind control. And in that mind control, they developed religious uh, rituals as well as um, shamanic activities to make the person participate in that particular action. So it is not surprising that they were really concerned about pain management in those periods and did what they could around where they were living. And it's very advanced period of management was seen at that time, 5,000 years ago, 3,000 years ago, in Indus Valley civilization. The Sanskrit comes from there. And they have written in Vedas about the management of health. And some of these things in Hindu therapy is you must have divine ideas, pilgrimages, and, and the prayers, as is mind control in a way. Scientific, there are drugs, that is the herbs. Uh, if you will recall, Ayurveda really started with the medicine coming from India. And then the controlled diet, how you manage your diet determines a lot about how your health will be. And there were minor surgeries. This was the first country which showed how to do rhinoplasty at the time. And the mental control that you must discipline your mind of whatever you're suffering from, and you will be better if you discipline your mind. So that is a philosophy they had about 3,000 years ago. Yeah, but at the same time, uh, at the same period, Chinese were also very well developed. So we are looking at three different civilizations about that period of time. But they didn't believe in something supernatural. They believed in what is natural around them, that is the environment. And they said there is a bad environment or a good environment. There is a good energy or a bad energy. And it's the balance between the two which makes the environment become OK. But the same thing can apply to the human anatomy, that the environment inside us will also be OK if we balance our negative and positive energies. So that is one of the reasons why acupuncture was uh, discovered or described 
after observing a lot of soldiers who were fight, fighting the wars for 3,000 years, and they found that if there is an injury in one part of the skin, that it will affect the pain of some part of the viscera in the body. Greeks were coming close after, and they learned, and they had similar uh, knowledge, but they brought it more rational, more scientific in their thoughts, and more philosophical than it has been previously it included that with their religious facilities as well. So here there are these classical civilizations who did a lot about pain, and we don't do much better than what they did at that time. And that's the impressive part of it. What have we done anymore? However, you know, the time goes on in the medieval period. And medieval period basically means Middle Ages. And it's an early medieval period and the late middle period. And uh, early medieval period really was the Christian era, which was starting up. And unfortunately, the civ classical civilization's knowledge base was suppressed during the time as the Christian influence influence in Europe. And when that happened, the knowledge which was already there in these civilizations, as I talked about, was not being practiced for centuries. And that was the Dark Ages. And in those ages, a person who is ill will be blessed by a, a priest rather than treated by a, um, a doctor, which was done previously. Uh, and it was shunned to go to the doctor rather than have a religious faith. Unfortunate because we suppressed the progress of medical knowledge, which was going through at that time until 15th century when uh, printing press came up, universities were built up, and the age of Renaissance, the late Middle Ages, which came up, and people got interested in trying to get more knowledge, discovered that they were hidden, this knowledge of classical period, and was sent over to the Middle East medieval period. Middle East medieval period did not lose that knowledge. They practices. The Arabists really developed pharmacotherapy, pharmacies, knowledge of how to create drugs, and continue to manage what they already knew from the Greek period. So when the Renaissance came up, all that knowledge which they uh, built up came back to Europe. And when it did, pharmacies were started, and uh, medical practice was discovered, and many, many scientific uh, innovations and discoveries were created from the Renaissance period. So we have to say that after 15th century, lots of scientific changes occurred uh, in our culture. But even in 1700, you know, during the wars when they had injuries, there was no way to treat their pain, acute pain. You have to treat what they could, amputation or injury or uh, sewing a, a war wound. Uh, there was no treatment other than what I talked about, scopolamine, and hyacinamine, and then opium. And uh, uh, even, even in early part of the 18th century, if they had to have a minor surgery, which usually was minor because they could do superficial surgery, the, the patients had to be held down. They were given whiskey, they were given opium, and uh, soothing their pain but it was a painful condition to have something done surgically. So you could see we really did not do very well for pain management all these centuries. Now, 18th century onwards, or late 17th and 18th century onwards, really scientific development occurred, which is amazing to me how these people really thought of uh, um, medicine in a different way. Not from philosophy point of view, not from religion point of view, not from just a natural day's life point of view, but scientific point of view. What is the science behind it? If you travel on this uh, 
River, you find that the first time somebody even thought about how pain is transmitted. And this is Johannes Muller who wrote this treatise and said, the pain starts from one place and travels through a pathway, it is transmitted, and when it reaches a certain target, one will feel the pain. And this is my theory of transmission. There were other theories as well, but this is how they started looking at that pain has a neurogenic pathway or a nerve pathway. And the other people who also got involved in the neurosurgical area and innovated many experimental procedures, which made it, uh, at one time, we did not know whatever we felt was from the brain or from the heart. We were told that it is from the brain what we're feeling, but we still don't know what the nervous system was. These people said, there is a peripheral nervous system, there is a central nervous system, there is an afferent pathway, there is an efferent pathway, and there is different function for different nerves. So we, we really owe a lot of debt to these innovators who made us understand what nervous system was. And the other side of the coin is application to the patients became a very important thing and these stand out as the people who made us understand some of the pain syndromes we see. Silas Weir Mitchell wrote a fantastic book on neuropathic pain. The patients they suffered, why they suffered, why they continue to suffer, what was their daily course, and uh, we have learned from them a lot. Henry had talked about the descending pathways or the motor pathways and sensory pathways, and Sherrington talked about complexes uh, inside the uh, nervous system where there are centers of activity different from transmission. So you can see that science really had progress. We know that we knew opium had analgesic properties, but nobody knew what, con what part of opium was active as an analgesic. Sir Turner is the one who worked on it, experimented on himself, as well as experimented on school children going uh, to school, take them into his apartment, which is in between their houses, and experiment on them, the dosages, and found that the drug which gives analgesia had this potency, this dosage was effective, this dosage was, complicate, was uh, giving complications, and he, named that morphine uh, to honor the goddess Morpheus in, in Greek mythology. So you could see uh, that morphine really originate from the work of Sir Turner. And as we go along, then advances occurred in analgesia. So far I've told you we still had people who could not be having a safe analgesic period during surgery or in an accident. They were have, still having difficulty. We didn't know what to do other than what we're still doing all those years. But things started to change in the late 18th century. And nitrous oxide was discovered. And this is a demonstration of nitrous oxide given for dental extraction in 1845, the birth of analgesia, controllable analge analgesia, which we could practice on a daily basis. And then the ether, use of ether, the ether dome uh, for surgery in the neck, and that was 1846. So we can truly say that we started scientific uh, activity of taking care of pain, at least in the acute, acute phase, by controllable scientific methods. So that, I think, I call it the birth of analgesia. But there is no regional anesthesia at this time. There is no interventional pain medicine. The analgesia is poorly done, and it's still done at that time in 1846 or so with 
ethers and nitrous oxide and lots of accidents, no monitoring, people were dying badly, surgeons were using them really nearly because it was the only thing. And yet, there were a lot of fatalities, a lot of problems. So people were not satisfied with that progress. 1855, we get another advance, and that is Alexander Wood in Scotland, and uh, Prabhas in Spain were able to get together a, a syringe and then a needle and attach them together and used it for medical purposes. They started it for cancer therapy, but they were able to put a solution in that and inject it in the body in a controllable fashion. So as soon as that happened, cocaine was discovered as a good analgesis, 1884. And he's an ophthalmologist who was looking for some analgesia for eye surgery. He, uh, Sigmund Freud, gave him test this out, and he tested it, and he felt good. He presented it in Heidelberg in 1884. It's a cocaine will provide analgesia for your eye surgery. You don't have to put them to sleep. Uh, Halstead came there and started you know, doing it straight away in New York, and regional anesthesia became a fashion because they were so afraid of giving general anesthesia with so many fatalities. When that happened, you really have to say that is the birth of interventional pain medicine. And syringe and a needle injected to energize was started with uh, Carl Kohler. And it was called regional anesthesia. It was, it was for acute surgery, but it still was for analgesia and for a painful condition. So if you look at it, history of interventional pain medicine really is the history of regional anesthesia starting up. And we could easily call him the father of interventional pain medicine. As you go further, 1899 to 1930, everybody was doing regional anesthesia. They were really sick of how to manage these pain patients. So every pain condition they had, they wanted to use regional anesthesia. So here's Tafir doing spinal cocaine for control of sarcoma in the leg. Dogliati injected alcohol injection a trigeminal ganglion. And Anastasi and uh, Catherine did the first caudal for epidural uh, back pain. Not for these regional anesthesia procedures were developed for pain and not for surgery. Surgery was applied afterwards. And diagnostic block, will this analgesic relieve the pain? If that is so, then that is coming from that region. So they're looking for diagnostic block. Then they're looking at even looking at scientific way and in studying the pathways of pain. So you could see from 1899 to 1930, there was a, uh, I think, a, a golden age, if you will, for regional anesthesia. And yet, from 1930 to 1947, it disappeared. It disappeared because now the technical knowledge of general anesthesia became important. The uh, monitoring was done. Endotracheal tubes were discovered. And you could ventilate and control the vital functions of the, uh, the patients when they're asleep. And people preferred general anesthesia for that region. The anesthesiology specialty started because of that. And when that started, the surgeons gave up giving anesthesia and regional anesthesia and anesthesiology started to doing that. Anesthesiology really hated regional anesthesia. They preferred general anesthesia. John Lundy, who was at Mayo Clinic, he brought along Labatt, and when in that, they found that regional anesthesia given to a surgical patient did better than if general anesthesia was given. So he said, why don't I take both? I do a spinal, and then I put him to sleep. 
So in his uh, practice, he increased from 15% to 30% in the Mayo Clinic at that time when that's where the pentothal and the other IV uh, induction agents also started. So you could see regional anesthesia became a part of the regimen even for a, a surgical patient. And it wasn't one or the other, it was both because it's good for the patient. And Royal in Australia uh, used it for spasticity of patients by injecting regional anesthesia. Sweatlow used alcohol uh, for sympathetic blocks. So you could see it in various areas of pain. Arrowhood uh, and Sarnoff looked at uh, the very small dose of local anesthetic can be used as a subacute continuous infusion. So they thought of all those things long before we are doing it today. And it is to their credit that we are now advancing what they have already done. And revert then, Robenstein, of course, looked at why does a 2% procaine, which lasts for one hour, 90 minutes, still give you pain relief two days later. He was wondering why, if you relieve the pain, it didn't come back straight away. So he started looking at all those conditions. And 1948 to 1970 was a period where anesthesiologists didn't know what to do. Halothane was there, local anesthetic was there. Should we be one or the other? There were lots of debates at that time. And then this guy, Manny Pepper, and Rowenstein said, anesthesiologists have a role to manage chronic pain. What were they doing at the time? Surgeons will refer these cancer patients to them. Hey, he's terminally ill, he's hurting, do something. So we'll go ahead, do sympathetic blocks, celiac plexus block, or even rhizotomies with alcohol and phenol. That was our role, a specialized practice referred to us by a specialized doctor, and we didn't see them before, we didn't see them afterwards, but we did that procedure. They said, no, no, you must do a little bit more. You have a right to do chronic pain like anybody else, not just the referred patients. So they promoted anesthesiology to become chronic pain or pain doctors very vigorously in this period of time, which was controversial. In 1970, and that's the time I started, I started my pain clinic in 1969. And so you, we didn't have C arms, we didn't have uh, specialized, we had needles, we knew sympathetic blocks, we did, so we did everything blindly. And we did it for diagnosis of your therapeutic procedures. I was told, what voodoo am I doing today? Uh, and lidocaine, bupocaine was usually mixed, and phenol and alcohol solutions were the ones which we were using. So you could see that we were limited, but at least we were giving full attention to chronic pain patients in this period of time. And believe it or not, even before 1980, stimulators in the spine came up for clinical use. And when they came up, they came from three different companies. They start to become popular, but they were not very good to start with. And because they were not very good to start with, it failed to take the imagination of people until 1980 when the scientific development occurred in improving the, the, the devices, improving how they could be manufactured, how they were sturdy enough, how they were reliable enough, and this advanced technology started to develop from 1980 onwards. Continuous infusion, pharmacology of it, and use of it, and types of patients you can use, became a very, very important advance in 1980 onwards for not only uh, acute patients, but also chronic patients. And then the pumps, there were no pumps. When I first used a continuous infusion myself, I didn't have a pump, but the pumps came up and that was a pressure pump. And following that, there was a volume generated pump. And now you have all types of pumps, including portable pumps. 
and that's a great advance since 1980 onwards. And then we have innovative devices, multiple techniques for radio frequency procedures. This is your era, and you know it as much as I do of what different kinds of radio frequency techniques now are available. We have the epidroscopies, the spinoscopies. This is an advance in our interventional pain medicine. And as we go along further, we have to look at what have we done with all these things. Well, what we have done is uh, interventional pain physicians' achievements are uh, that we are refer the patient is referred to us by another physician. They don't, most of the times, they don't walk off the street. We are specialized people. So that's one thing we just done. We do as a single modality, but mostly as a multiple modalities with all multiple modality physicians uh, participating in it. That is what we do. We have a highly specialized physician who's trained, who prefer, who is preferred by the patient. If anybody who does any interventional pain medicine, they know that patient prefer you rather than anybody else to do that procedure because you're trained as an interventionalist. That is the status we have achieved at this present time. We have to know a lot of the devices which are coming up or how they are performing, how they be technically being used. So it's a constant knowledge uh, about these new devices as they are coming, whether it's a laser, whether it's a thermal, whether it's a radio frequency or even mechanical gadgets. And there is no doubt about it. But also there is a movement that, hey, guys, you're doing this, but are you sure it's helping? So there is an attempt to collect evidence-based medicine. And evidence-based medicine is critically looking at what we do. And some of them are not good results yet. You have this study here which says intrathecal um, infusion systems seems to be good in these conditions when compared to the te other techniques. Yet, I think the history is not entirely told uh, unless we look at some of the areas in the in development of interventional pain medicine. The physician specialist has to know definition of interventional pain practice that they are doing minimal invasive procedures. They are percutaneous precision needle placements. They are uh, placements of drugs in targeted areas, ablation of targeted nerves, and percutaneous surgical techniques. All the accomplished interventional pain medicine. And a physician has to know theoretical, oral, and practical knowledge of these procedures before one can certify as interventional pain procedure. Doing one thing is not enough is doing all those things which are required in an interventional pain procedure is what an interventional pain procedure specialist should be. And yet, we see all these specialities who do that, whether they are certified or not. The greatest number is anesthesiology, just because six, you know, they are practicing regional anesthesia. Neurosurgery comes next, and orthopedic is not so good. And physical medicine is next uh, because they do certain spinal procedures. But family practice, psychiatry, uh, interventional radiologists also do this. Is that right? Maybe. But is it also maybe wrong? Maybe also. And that what we have to look at. Is it right to have all these people do this? Or should they all be combined into a specialized internal pain medicine who can do all this? The question for you. So what is our impact on pain after all this? We've done so many things. We achieved so many things. We have great centers. Do we really take care of our pain? Yes, 
Acute pain we take care of very well. Post-operative pain we take care of very well. Obstetric pain we take care of very well. Chronic pain, forget it. We don't do it. 42% or greater are suffering, whatever you do. They have poor general health, poor functioning, poor social functions, low vitality, and it's like dumping a patient doing interventional pain medicine. Should we be doing these things on these patients? Is it worth it? So here is what I think <coughs> we should think about and this is controversial, but I'll tell you anyway. We should not treat any patient who has tolerable pain. We should only treat patients if they say they have intolerable pain. So pain intensity is the only measure for which an interventional pain physician should look at and say, okay, I'm willing to treat you. The rest of the time, they have a tolerable pain Go and see your physician, go and see your PMR, go and see your neurosurgeon, go and see your orthopedics. I don't want to do a procedure on you. So only do it if you think it's intolerable, which cannot be treated in a conventional way. So that kind of patient may be a myofascial pain, suddenly a curve, cannot go away after six weeks. So you do trigger point injections, that's okay. But you have tried the others. All the patients who have chronic conditions, arthritis, diabetes, and uh, others who recurrently become intolerable, then you can do the procedure. But don't do it unless it becomes intolerable. Same thing with headaches and the patients with us, spontaneous pains and disc prolapse, which come up with trigeminal neurologists, which is so intense intensity so much that something has to be done, nobody can do it, then interventional pain procedure. What are we looking for? Relief of pain. Can an interventional pain procedure do that? Yes. Problem is, it cannot do it for a long time. Or it's indicated for patients who had a pain procedure before and when they cannot maintain the tolerable situation, then a procedure can be done to maintain the tolerable pain for a longer period of time. Example, spinal cord stimulations, intrathecal drug delivery system, uh, and certainly it's indicated for patients with a terminally cancer, end of life, and palliative care. Here, example is intrathecal drug delivery system on these patients. What we shouldn't be doing these procedures for are patients who previously failed interventional procedures, or patients who are addicted, or patients whose cognition is poor, they don't understand what we are saying, and whose families expect you to give them total relief you'll have a, a result which will never, they'll never be satisfied. Or on the patients, just because another physician prescribed this procedure to be done without you knowing anything about the patient. If you then look at the crystal ball and say, hey, I know the future of interpositional pain medicine, and what is that future? Can we really look at it? We know that we will have better trained pain physicians with adequate medical curriculum, residency and fellowship programs. I think uh, things are going in that direction. I think they will continue and we'd certainly accomplish that. We know that there will be standardized examinations in interventional pain practice that's happening now and that will continue and only improve. We know that there will be a certification of pain physicians when they have taken the exams and that will be well received both uh, per, on a personal basis and on the country basis. My personal conclusion is, however, that we need to look at pain intensity as a marker for pain procedure. 
we need to reclassify pain as tolerable or intolerable when you see a patient. Interventional pain physicians should not treat patients for psychological conditions or functional impairment or the treatment for drug addiction. They should not prescribe drugs to pain patients. Our reputation has been tarnished by overdose of these medications which were inappropriately given in the past and we should get away from that. We are specialists in interventional pain medicine, not pres prescribing drugs. The e efficacy of procedure should only be evaluated as to whether the procedure reduces the intolerable pain to tolerable pain. No more, no less. Thank you.